Hello there, uh, my name is Nick Evans and I, I teach and research Russian and history at Clare College. Um, currently I'm doing that remotely because of the coronavirus um, and I hope that you and all your families are well and safe at this time. Now strange enough, one of the things I used to talk to students who came to visit us at Clare about was the uh, pandemic that swept across uh, the Mediterranean world in the 6th century. Um, I'm going to be talking about that today uh, with you and thinking about it again. And one of the things I, I, I used to think about three things with the students who came to visit us, and they were the following. We used to think about how societies react to crises such as the one we're actually experiencing and what that tells us about the society. We think about how historians use their sources and we think about how uh, scientists and historians can work together to understand the past. Now, since I last uh, discussed this with a group of students, obviously you and I and we have all been through an experience that in some ways means that we understand things about that experience that are, is described in our sources that I had no idea about really when, when I last taught this. But maybe this will provide us with an opportunity to think about how our experiences may help us ask new questions about the sources that we have and maybe Understanding something about and looking at those sources might help us think through some things that we're experiencing right now. Now, I imagine you would have heard of the Black Death and that, that first reached uh, England in 1348. Now, strangely enough, the Clare College, uh, in its founding statutes, mentions the Black Death. Uh, Elizabeth de Burr, the Lady of Clare, uh, talks about how in... Um, one of the reasons why she's giving the money to, to establish the college is because of, um, is because of the, the loss of life and, and, uh, that has been caused by the Black Death. And so she's trying to re-establish learning after the Black Death. But in this video, we're going to be talking about an earlier pandemic, one that is named after the emperor of the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century, in the mid-6th century, em emperor at the time that it hit. Now, when we talk about the Byzantine Empire, what we're talking about is the Christian uh, Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, and we use that term, it's a modern term that we use for that empire from around the, um, uh, that time right down to the uh, 15th century. When its capital, Constantinople, what is now Istanbul, was captured by the Ottoman Empire. Now, it, as I say, its capital was Constantinople, uh, what is now Istanbul. Um, and at the time we're looking at, in the time of Justinian, the Byzantine Empire was engaged in a number of major wars with the Persian Empire to its east and also in the, in the west, in the western Mediterranean, in Italy and in North Africa, fighting to try and conquer for uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, bits that formerly belonged to the, to the, the Western Roman Empire. Um, and you can see on the map on your slide how much the empire expanded as a consequence of these wars. Now, on your slide, you should be able to see Justinian himself. No prizes for guessing which one the emperor is. He's got a round halo around his head. He's standing right in the middle. To his right, you can see uh, his general, Belisarius. That's that man in the beard. Now, he's the person who captured this city of Ravenna, where you can see where this mosaic comes from. On his left, you can see the bishop, Maximian. Now you can tell that Maximian has paid for this uh, uh, mosaic because he's put his name above his head and he's, um, and he's uh, put himself right next to the emperor to show how important he is. Now, we're going to be looking at a um, source, a couple of sources by Procopius, who was the secretary to Belisarius, that bearded general. Um, he was an eyewitness to many of Belisarius' wars as a consequence. But he was also an eyewitness to the plague that hit Constantinople in 541. There were actually several waves of plague that, uh, between this time, between the mid, uh, between, uh, mid 6th century and the mid 8th century, as it spread further and further. And, as it, and the ways in which it moved tells us some things about the way in which that world was connected. For instance, it reaches Ireland already in the 540s, it doesn't reach England until the 660s. We also see the uh, sources referring to it in China in the mid-7th century. Now we don't know exactly how many people 
died as a consequence of this plague because we don't have very good f data on what the overall population um, of, of the societies we're looking at were at the time anyway. But we can tell from our sources that it was a very serious um, uh, plague with very serious effects and very serious loss of life. OK, so we're now going to be looking at how Procopius, as we've seen, an eyewitness source, wrote about the plague. Procopius, as we said, was the uh, work for Belisarius, that general, that bearded general. And he's famous for writing three books. He's famous for writing uh, History of the Wars. Um, he's famous for writing a book that is known as The Secret History. And he's also famous for writing a book about Justinian's building projects. Now, there's something rather strange about his writing projects, because the, uh, the wars looks like a official history. It's very sober, sombre and, and, and serious in the way it's presented. The secret history, on the other hand, says lots of really very rude things indeed about Justinian and, in particular, about the Empress Theodora. You should now be able to see Theodora on your slide. Again, no prize for guessing which one the Empress is. She's in the middle. She's got a halo. Um, now, Procopius is extremely rude about both uh, Justinian and Theodora. The text is known as the secret history because, unsurprisingly, it wasn't possible to publish this when it's so rude about the emperor and the empress. Now, in the moment, I'm going to ask you to pause your video and to look at some of these texts, uh, from, uh, which are passages, extracts from passages, translated into English from the original Greek. That was the language that was used in that part of the empire at that time. You'll see the first of these passages, taken from the history of the wars, um, describes how people like Procopius first became aware of the, of the plague. Now, they were aware of it first from appearing in Egypt. That's part of the empire at the time. And he mentions the town Pelusium where he sees it appearing. And how it then spread to Alexandria and also to Palestine, also part of the empire. There's one word in the first passage um, that may be rather unfamiliar to you. There's a reference to the clamus. Now, the clamus is that cloak you can see uh, the officials wearing on your slide, uh, pinned at the shoulder. And so where it talks about how nobody was seen wearing the clamus, it's almost as if it's saying nobody was seen wearing suit and tie during this period. So that's kind of force of what we're reading. OK, so time took the passages. Um, and as you do, I want you to think about the three things on the current slide. OK, so here's passage number one from the walls. Pause the video and have a look and think about it. And here's the passages from The Secret History. Again, pause the video to give yourself time to read it. Now, what do you notice about the different passages um, and the way they different ways they describe the plague. Did you notice, for example, how the first passage tried to give you a sense of just how extreme it was, how far it spread? Talks about it over the whole world. Talks about it in every island, cave and mountain ridge. It talks about how it also uh, affected the Persians, the, the Byzantine en enemies and the barbarians, and that's the word they use for people who aren't Romans, aren't Christians. Or did you notice the way it described the effects on everyday life? That passage, does it remind you of the ways in which, on our news reports, they describe not only the direct effects of the current pandemic, but also the effects on jobs and the economy? You see that reflected in that, in that passage. OK, and now let's look at the two passages and think about the different ways in which they talk about the emperor's own illness. In the history of the wars, the emphasis on the emperor's illness seems to be in the context of a description of how the effects of this are so severe that official life st starts to grind to a halt. But in the secret history, we get some of the political intrigue. We hear about how there were rumours that the emperor had even died. We read about the manoeuvring to replace him. And, characteristically for this text, we get a sideswipe against Theodora. What do you make of these differences? Does it make you trust one source more or the other? And does it affect our assessment of the two sources 
that the same writer can write such different things in his different books. The Wars describes the author as an eyewitness. It describes how it spreads. The Secret History makes some other claims. It actually claims about that the Emperor himself was responsible for the plague and calls the Emperor a demon in human form. Now does that change the way we read that first source when we read this in the Secret, secret History? Well, fortunately, we have some other sources to help us understand this plague. Not only other types of written history, but also other types of evidence. For instance, we have this inscription, that's a piece of carved writing, above an entrance to a church in a very small settlement in Zarava in Syria, also part of the empire at the time. Now, some modern historians, reading Procopius, for instance, had wondered a bit about the way in which he describes it reaching everywhere and wondered a bit whether it was actually really concentrated in major cities like Constantinople, where he's based. But a piece of evidence like this, with a date on, and with a description of the effects of the plague, shows us it's reaching even settlements like this. It, you may have noticed it describes how the symptoms of the bishop who catches the plague, how it affects his groin and his, um, and his armpits. Well, those are the symptoms of the bubonic plague, and ones that we saw in the description of the Emperor's illness. We also have documents showing the social and economic effects of the plague. And some of these may have some similarities with things you might recognise. For instance, we have documents showing how tenants are under pressure and ask for rent um, um, relief. Uh, and, and this is talking particularly about tenant farmers. Or we see how people who are paid wages, start to demand higher wages from their employers and actually seem to be successful in doing so because their employers um, are finding it harder to find people to work for them. And there's a law we see published by the emperor, by the authorities, which tries to reverse some of those wage increases. So it's a political struggle that's, that follows through from the economic consequences of the pandemic. Now, we also have pieces of evidence like coinage itself, which can tell us something about the changing um, economic circumstances. We know that taxes were paid in gold coin, but, uh, wages, are pa uh, but wages are paid in bronze coin. So where we see the gold coin getting finer and lighter, we know that those bronze coins that people have their wages are paid in are going to get them more, more, more. And so we can see the ways in which the uh, effects of this are being felt in the economy. Now, a lot of the understanding of the plague that uh, we've been talking about, and the later Black Death, comes from a third pandemic that spread across uh, the world from East Asia in the late 19th century. The scientist Alexander Yersel um, discovered the bacterium that causes the plague. And he got the plague named after him, Yersinia pestis, the bacterium named after him. Um, plague is a form of bacterial disease, I should say. So that's different from coronavirus, which is a viral disease. Now we know about its symptoms. It's the fever, the headache, the weakness that it causes. And in its bubonic form, we know that it attacks the lymph nodes. Uh, and those are concentrated in places such as under the armpits or in the groin. And those are those symptoms that we saw reported in our very, very early sources. It's spread by flea bites, and usually at the point, and those fleas are carried by rats, and it's the point at which rats die that fleas often jump from um, those animal populations to human populations. Now, obviously, around the world, most of us are concerned about the coronavirus pandemic at the moment, but there are places in the world where plague is still an issue, um, and that includes parts of the US. And what you can see on your screen now is some public health advice, um, um, which is issued in places in areas that are affected. And it warns people in those affected areas to watch out for a moment where you notice a lot of rodents dying, because that might be a moment where fleas might be jumping to human populations. It also advises people against sleeping with their pets for similar reasons. Now, if you'd been visiting Clare College today, you might have seen this sculpture. Any sense of what it is? 
Yeah, it's the DNA double helix that was discovered by uh, James uh, Watson when he was here at Clare, along with uh, Francis Crick, using data that was um, created by um, Rosalind Franklin at, at King's uh, in London. Now, scientists now can use DNA from um, ancient remains in order to understand the relationship between those different plague uh, pandemics. Now, some of you may have been to the Museum of London, and near to that is a 14th century cemetery from people who suffered from the Black Death. And scientists have been able to look at their DNA in order to understand the relationship between the disease that they got and the disease that is around now. Now, more recently, people have also discovered that they can look at a 6th uh, century plague cemetery in Austria, where they, have, um, where they can look at the strands of, the, of plague that was around at the time of Justinian and Procopius. Now, this has led scientists to try to reconstruct the different plague, uh, the different pandemics. And you can see here on your map, or on this slide, a map which, try, which shows that reconstruction. Now, some of this map has some fixed uh, data points. Now, you, for instance, if you look at that red square, that's, the, that's that cemetery in Austria. Or the green square in London, well, that's that 14th century um, uh, cemetery. Or that green square down near to the source of the Nile, that is um, where a reservoir of this Plague, the same strand of the plague, still survives among the animal population today. So we have some fixed data points that we have from science that gives us information that we could not possibly have got from our historical sources. But a word of caution, if you look at those arrows that describe how the, the, the plague spread, those are hypotheses, those are links that the scientists have made between their data points, some of which have a historical basis, but some of which are much more hypothetical. For instance, we know that the Black Death did spread from Central Asia to Europe. But for the 6th century plague, the evidence is much less clear, and our source Procopius gives us the impression that it didn't. So that's a word of warning about how we use these different types of evidence. Now, having looked at that scientific evidence, we're going to turn back to Procopius to see what he says about the causes of the plague. Here's him in the wars. Now, in the case of all other scourges sent from heaven, some explanation of a cause might be given by daring men, such as the many theories propounded by those who are clever in these matters, for they love to conjure up causes which are absolutely incomprehensible to man and to fabricate outlandish theories of natural philosophy. But for this calamity, it is quite impossible either to express in words or to conceive in thought any explanation, except indeed to refer it to God. And this is a very interesting passage, because we know that the state religion at the time was Christianity, and we read in this passage Procopius saying that it would not be acceptable uh, to um, try to explain these events by any methods other than God's will. But he also lets us know that there were other people coming to other kinds of explanation, including those of natural philosophy, which is a term really for what we would call science. But, as we've seen, in the secret history, Procopius, having given that kind of official version, which is that we shouldn't try to explain this, gives a rather different version, where he pins it on Justinian himself. Let's end by thinking about those three questions I posed at the beginning. How do societies react to a crisis like the one we're currently experiencing? How do people pull together? What new tensions emerge? What does all this reveal about the society? How is society changed by this kind of experience? Now, I don't know if any of you have watched any of these uh, disaster movies. When I used to talk to students about the Justinianic plague, I'd ask them to think about these movies and think about what they tell us about how societies, like our own, which produces these movies, think about how they imagine they would respond to something like climate change, a pandemic, or probably less likely, a zombie apocalypse. Well, what have we learnt 
from our own experience, we can ask a rather different question now. How does that change and affect the way we read these sources? We've been looking at Procopius, who was writing a very, very long time ago, in a very different kind of society. But were there challenges that he and his society faced that may have some similarities with the, with the challenges we face? Can we now ask new questions? As historians, we always need to think carefully about what kinds of sources we use and how they use, we use them. And sometimes reading some of our sources, we may be tempted to think that what we're getting looks a bit like fake news. But the next question to ask is, why would a historian or the writer of our source give us fake news? What's their reason for trying to put a spin on it? What, what, what is causing that? And that in itself tells us quite a lot about the time in which the source is produced. That's a useful piece of information. And it's not a bad approach for looking at fake news in our own time either. And finally, we looked at how historians and scientists might work together to understand the past. Now, we learnt things from the scientific evidence that we couldn't have got from Procopius or from the other types of um, historical data. But we did still get important things about the social and economic consequences, or what it felt like to live through an experience like that in Procopius, that may help us think about um, the, these events in different terms. Well, thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope at some point before too long we may have the chance to meet at Clare College in person. But in the meantime, I wish you and all your families all the best.